my work is on um, uh, chikungunya virus and its interaction with uh, the vectors. It's basically a vector-borne disease. And uh, what is chikungunya? What I did notice when I came here and I spoke about to, to those who, to whom with I interacted, not many people were uh, very much aware of uh, this virus. So I thought I will give you an uh, introduction about the virus and why it is important, why it is a major public health uh, concern in our country. What it actually literally means in an African language is that which bends up. Uh, that is the effect the disease has on the individuals that it inflicts, that there is absolutely um, total morbidity and the joints uh, are affected in such a way that the person is not able to move at all for a couple of days. And it exists as uh, two uh, phases. One is the acute febrile phase, and the other is the, um, the chronic phase, which lasts, the acute phase lasts for about a week or 10 days. But the chronic phase can last up to as much as two years, and uh, extreme, with extreme morbidity. So if you're going to talk about the classical symptoms, what you have are, uh, you have the fever, the febrile phase, you have the headache and associated pain. You have muscle extreme arthralgia, you have reports of myalgia, and uh, you have excruciating back pain, and minor, minor and the major joints are being uh, greatly affected. So apart from the classical symptoms, what it also has are the other associated uh, symptoms that it can have. Why are these associated symptoms important? Is because of its closeness or the overlaying diagnostic or the overlaying symptoms that it can have along with a more popular disease or a more uh, uh, another disease called the dengue, wherein you see most of the most of the um, the clinical features have overlaying um, symptoms with just gradation, difference in the grades. So what becomes important is that or what, while dengue is associated with mortality and, and complicated phase, uh, chikungunya is self-limiting and uh, because of which is mostly underrepresented or it is underdiagnosed or the minute you have, and you also have better diagnostic skills better diagnosis for dengue, which you can detect right on the day one of clinical onset of symptoms. Whereas in the case of chikungunya, you have to depend on you know, the antibodies, which comes much later, because of which it is largely uh, underrepresented. And what makes it even more troublesome is uh, these two viruses exist as co-infections in the host, which means that while you're treating only one, the patient management becomes different in the case of a co-infection. So just a brief introduction of what the virus is. It is an RNA virus, single-stranded, positively single-stranded, and it's a member of uh, genus alpha virus. Alpha virus is a group of around 30, 32 viruses. And what is important about them is these viruses are able to infect a, a whole host, a whole range of hosts. And, um, uh, they are around 12 KB, and uh, they have a uh, genomic organization where the first two-third of the five prime um, region is uh, in encodes the replication complex and non-structural proteins, whereas the small one-third of the three prime encodes for structural proteins, which are involved in the viral assembly. The virus exists as uh, three genotypes, unlike. Uh, dengue, which has serotypes, it has only genotypes, and these genotypes have been assigned based on the, the, the time it was first identified. Basically, in Africa, you have the Western African genotype, you have the Asian genotype, and you have all the others, the Eastern, Central, and the South African uh, geno um, genotypes, which is called the ECSA genotype. It basically falls in sylvatic cycle in Africa and an urban cycle in Asia and Europe, mainly because of the spillover. What is most important in this uh, infection is uh, the vector uh, or the way it interacts with the vector. The main vector is uh, Aedes aegypti, and it also has an atypical vector, Aedes albopictus, which gains notoriety and importance in the latest pandemic. So if you're going to talk about the distribution of chikungunya virus, this is how it is as of March 2015. You have most of Asia, Southeast Asia being affected. 
you have the endemic region in Africa anyway there. You have half of Latin America and some parts, even though it says U.S. is, is there, is more of the southern parts of the U.S. that is mainly affected. What is very surprising is this was what was the status in 2010. This was what, of course, you, even in 2010, you had Italy being, um, being affected by this virus. But as of 2015, you can see the spread, which definitely is a global concern because of the kind of spread of this <coughs> infection. And what it also coincides is the distribution of the vector species in the globe. So when you see the distribution of the Aedes, this is the data of uh, Albopictus because between Aedes aegypti and Albopictus, Albopictus is much more robust. Um, mainly the, um, the distribution of the mosquito population depends on the climate and the, and the climatic conditions of the place the, of, and the geographical uh, conditions. What you see is Albopictus is so robust that it just requires a very small window of uh, of conducive environment for it to start propagating. As you can see, since 2001, the kind of expansion of these species is really alarming, as opposed to where it was indigenous. And there is a distinct spread of these species, so which automatically says that it is just a time bomb waiting to. And this is what happened in the US, actually. You could see the Albopictus for quite some time in, 2000, in the 2090s. But what we do now see is that you've got the cases right there. So it has reached here. And it's just a matter of time when it reaches the other places where the, where the infection goes. So which gives the importance of the virus vis-a-vis -vis the, the vector population. Now let's come to the, the, the way the latest pandemic hit. There was a pandemic across continents in 2005. And what were the salient features of uh, these, this pandemic was that in vector biology, there was a single point mutation that shifted the vector compatibility from Egypti to Albopictus. Even though Al Egypti was known to be the typical vector that has been infecting it for, for whenever, this pandemic, this, this time in 2005, there was an, most of the cases that were seen was transmitted only by Albopictus. And we also saw that there was, there was a single mutation that was caused. I will explain this uh, in the slides to come. What also we witnessed was there was a very distinct differences in the chronic phase of the disease. Until the time, what happened was the acute phase was very much similar. Of course, you did have some non-classical non symptoms uh, like diarrhea. You had some other symptoms which was not associated with a classical um, uh, diagnosis. But what was also alarming was the an extended chronic phase of um, this infection, which uh, led us to think maybe is there a role in the host immunity or is it just the impact of mutation that has already affected the vector that is also affecting the host? The next one is the evolution of virus. The, main, the, next, com the, most, um, the next obvious question was whether there was recombination that was happening in the vi virus that is resulting in its uh, virulence. At that time, we did not have much information. But as of, as of today, there is a paper uh, based on um, um, the virus uh, sequence from India where they have clearly shown that there is recombination happening. But that again was just on the basis of two or three sequences. So uh, genome-wide or a uh, uh, whole genome sequencing of a whole lot of viruses are important to study and understand this phenomena much more clearly. So which brings us to the next important thing of what is the involvement of chikungunya and in India? Um, while it first started in India, you, it was affecting the southern parts of the country. But as years went by, there was an increasing as many as 20 states out of the 26 have been infected by, affected by this virus. And um, India is, uh, is uh, the capital of a whole slew of uh, diseases, capital of uh, diabetes, and it's also the world capital for dengue. And you have, because of this, the additional burden of this uh, dengue, which is uh, a major issue, 
you also have to treat all the other associated co-infections along with that to come up with a strategic control for the viruses. So let's just talk about briefly about how the whole thing happened in chikungunya. Um, to give due uh, respect, uh, it was not, everything didn't start from uh, India. Something came to India also in 2005 when the, when the, when the first uh, case of chikungunya came from the Indian oceans. So when it first hit Maharashtra, this is the eastern part of the country, um, this is important because historically because chikungunya has a way of hitting um, native population every two, three decades, every uh, almost three decades. So the first time when it hit um, way back in the 70s, Maharashtra and over here you have West Bengal. These two states were hit, but it was a different genotype that came that time. It was not the genotype that we're talking about now. And after that, the neighboring states, the next year, the neighboring states were all susceptible, all infected, but all having these cases. And by 2007 or so, 2007, 8, the whole lower part, the southern part of India was totally, you had millions of cases, I mean, unimaginable, you had millions of cases affected around that time. And what was important in 2009, what happened was in 2008, 2009, was while all these cases were showing infection by Aedes aegypti, these two states in that, in the case of 2009, reported involvement of albopictus in the spread of the disease, which was very alarming because uh, albopictus has a more universal existence in India than aegypti. And uh, while aegypti is restricted to uh, indoor population, uh, indoors, uh, albopictus was confined everywhere. You could find it in uh, peri, um, in semi-urban areas, in rural areas, wherever you find a more um, elaborate existence of albopictus. But what happened after that was, in the, the next year, coming years, it was again Egypt which gained importance. And as of 2010, you have all these parts, except for this cluster in the north because of the climatic conditions, and over here maybe because of physical barrier, almost all the, the whole part of India is being affected. Again, what makes it important for India is because India is a hub of chickpea spread. So as you can see, when it first came, the first wave that it came over here from the Indian uh, oceans, uh, island, Indian ocean islands uh, over here, it went to India and almost this other subsequent spread has been happening from India. So it makes it very important to understand what is the, the structure of the virus within the country to understand uh, the virus basically. So what we did was uh, we are actively uh, involved in studying the divergence of the, stud of the virus in India. So we choose, uh, we have excellent collaborations with uh, two hospitals in two different locations in the country. And uh, back in India, we have what is called as referral centers. So most of these infectious diseases are referred to these, are have to be reported to these uh, centers. And the national data is collected from these centers so that you have the, the database of the infections or the way the infection is evolving around the country is monitored. So we had these two, ho these two hospitals, one in Delhi and Mumbai. As I told you, the reason for having Mumbai and Delhi was because here you are having viruses circulating for a longer period of time. You also had an older virus, which could be still be circulating. And you have Delhi, where you are having much, the circulation of viruses much, much later. And uh, what we also wanted to do was not only do the virus uh, uh, evolutionary studies or virus um, um, structural you know, genomic, what we also wanted to do was correlate with the clinical information and get that clinical information and, and correlate with the clinical information to actually understand how the virus is progressing. And we've also been doing it for an over a period of time. So the longitudinal study can tell you the evolving, the, the, the nature of the evolving viruses. So what we did find was um, that there is a new signature that is evolving post-2010. So what we did was we have close to around, um, as of date, around 160 whole genome sequences available for this virus and more than thousands of uh, structural targeted regions. We collected all the samples, all the sequence information, uh, 
and um, we did an uh, alignment phylogenetic analysis and a sequence alignment. And what we did see was, this is the rest of India, this is the African, Asian and then ECS, the classical um, lineage uh, genotypes, genotypes. This is the sample which we collected from all the rest of India and we compared it against with our sequences that those are around close to 40, 45 sequences from Delhi and in the structural proteins. And what we did see was that there is a distinct signature that is coming. When we try to Path, ma map the path of this evolutionary path of this virus, we see that most of this, these are the parental lineage. We are having the, the African, the Asian and the ECSA lineage. And apart from after that, when you see most of it is clustering around, all the state data is clustering around one region. Whereas in the case of Delhi, it's forming a subcluster with just one virus, with just one, uh, one sequence which is contributing to this. So clearly there is an, uh, uh, an uh, there is a change in the virus basically post 2010. And what would be important is to study what is the effect of these changes. For that we are right now, we are currently doing the whole genome sequencing. We already have the clinical data for all these samples. A whole genome sequencing of, of close to around 70, 75 isolates and we hope to get some data out of this. Having spoken about the, the patient samples, what is also important is the role of the vector. So for this, uh, we did a vector epidemiology of uh, chikungunya. So what we did was, we just wanted to find out, it was not exactly just to know only about chikungunya, we also wanted to know what was the uh, transmission or the incidence of Aedes in the field population in, in and around Delhi. So these were the regions that we took. It was just a pilot analysis for want of, uh, it's an extremely extensive work. So, and we also wanted to see was whether you have, it is the common vector for both chikungunya and dengue. So we wanted to see if, you, we, if we could, these viruses, do they cohabit in the virus? What is the, 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 the scenario of uh, the transmission with uh, vis a -vis for uh, co-infections? So what we did see was that we could see uh, dengue and chikungunya virus in pool samples, pool was not much, it was just 10 sample, uh, 10 ADs that we pooled and in all of them, for any of the regions that we took, the samples were co-infected. We are very excited about these results. Number one, we would want to know what is the status in the population basis. The other one, of course, we definitely would want to know what is the role it plays in an individual insect. Is this out of a in single insect or is it in a population of insect that we're talking about? That would result later on, that will decide whether it is the viral titer that results in the cohabitation. There are a lot of questions that we can ask from here on. And what we also saw was whether there was going to be vertical transmission of chikungunya virus. What is vertical transmission? It is this where the, the virus is transmitted from mother to the egg from to, in, um, trans ovarian or transvenereal transmission. It's very clearly over here. The males are positive too. So it means that it is trans ovarian and uh, transvenereal. And what it also means is we do the collections of the immature stages, the larvae are collected and after that the, we emerge the, the, the larval population in our lab and only then we test it, which means that the larvae are basically pass positive for this chikungunya virus. The same for dengue as well. And uh, so uh, we do see that, so if you're able to target those positive populations in the field which are positive for this, we could actually stop an, an epidemic, an outbreak from happening. So we have approached our local government authorities with this data and they are very, um, they are really very excited about this. So we want to take to use this as a diagnostic for the field population so that we can test the field population even before the outbreak comes. Then comes the most important aspect of what is the role of the vectors in disease transmis transmission of chikungunya virus. It was seen that by several papers that there is a single mutation in the chikungunya virus that affects the vector potential and the vector specificity. There are different ways by which this happens. And one of the way is by, the, by making the different mosquito samples conducive for the viral growth, which the virus can attain by mutating itself to help in growing in new, uh, in new vir in vectors. So um, which brings us to the next important question of how important vectors are. It, uh, vectors are important in all kind of in disease transmittance because number one, they take part in the, co the completing the life cycle of the virus. They are amplifying host versus the incidental death versus an 
uh, dead end host, which is what the humans are. The actually vectors are the reservoirs of the pathogen. So disease transmittance entirely depends on the capacity of the vector to transmit and it's got nothing to do with the virus per se. So and why is this important? Because blood feed is an important phenomena in the life cycle of the mosquito because they need the proteins for laying eggs. So if you're going to talk about, this is an Aedes albopictus uh, mosquito and these are the various important, important organelles inside the mosquito. So when you take and when there's engorgement of blood and the blood is being filled by the whole gut is being taken by the mosquito, what happens afterwards? In the case of an anavaremic blood, the blood, the virus is retained much after the blood is being digested by the, the insect. And it is the capacity of this virus to either multiply or not to multiply that makes this mosquito and a susceptible species. So how do you actually do it? It's like you study populations and when you, depending on the title of the virus in, of the, in the host, depending on the viremic level that is there and the percentage of the population of the mosquitoes that are going being susceptible by the virus, you, you say that this vector, this species is a vector or not. For instance, in India, there are as many as 102 AD species of which there are only around five or six that are actively transmitting the dengue and chikungunya. In the case of malaria, there are almost 56 species of anaphylis, of which nine are vectors, official vectors, of which only four or five of them are vectors that, would, that are considered good vectors. So it is not important that all mosquitoes are going to transmit. It is a kind of information that the mosquito, is a kind of information that the virus is able to get. This is how it's explained over here. So when you're going to talk about a virus being in a viremic, uh, in a, the blood, when a virus enters the mosquito, it goes to an eclipse phase where there's a dwindling of its numbers. This dwindling goes to a very, very uh, critical number. And after that, the, it goes to a transmission phase. And it is in this transmission phase, it is this extrinsic incubation period that it is called that decides whether this virus is going to be retained in the mosquito or how susceptible or whether the vector, the, the mosquito can stay as a vector or not. Which what happened in Albopictus in the case of chikungunya, this, this extrinsic uh, incubation period was reduced because the single point mutation of the virus resulted in better binding of um, the virus onto Albopictus, thereby the Albopictus was getting more and more infective. It was able to infect, it got matured much faster. It was able to infect the population, much more population because the virus is going to stay in the salivary glands once it reaches there till the end of its life cycle. So once the virus is entering the, the mosquito, the mosquito has a few factors by which it's going to stop. There are defense mechanisms. It has immunity features. It has stress, oxidative stress. It has RNAi, which are important first level defense features by which it prevents the, the virus to enter the, the mosquito, to, to replicate, to, to uh, develop in it. But what the virus also does, they have protein, viral proteins by which they are able to counteract the RNAi of the host or they could also be host receptors which are aiding the, the growth of or attachment or the entry of the virus after which it, they are able to sustain in the virus. So our lab is working apart from the, the other aspect that I spoke about is how do mosquitoes cope with pathogen invasion. So what we, what, what we are, the questions that we are asking is to, uh, to decipher the role of the vector in, in the pathogen development and in the vectorial cap capacity, thereby helping in transmission. Uh, we are looking at two important aspects. One is the insect RNAi, with specific interest to microRNAs is what I will be talking to you today. The other one is the oxidative stress. So these two we are looking at in two different organisms. One is the chikungunya virus and the other is the plasmodium development in anaphylis. As we all know, there is indeed an intricate interplay between the host microRNAs and pathogenic viruses or pathogenic viruses in the host cell RNA machinery. 
Number one, there have been several cases where cellular microRNAs provide strong antiviral defense systems. There has been examples where uh, cellular microRNA may stimulate viral replication as you seen in the case of HCV. You also have instances where virus encode microRNAs that would target specific cellular genes that you see the, the classical example is the herpes cells, herpes viruses. And the virus can also regulate encode microRNAs that would regulate uh, viral gene expression, thereby they are able to hide from the, the host uh, defense and we are able to replicate when the time is conducive for them. Of course, there is also the latest one in animal viruses are the existence of viral RNAi suppressors. They are viral genes that compete with the host RNAi machinery and blocks the host RNAi, thereby enabling the virus to replicate in the host. Um, we use a variety of um, uh, technologies to pursue each of these questions. Uh, we work a lot on uh, next-gen databases, uh, high-throughput databases. So uh, we have the network, so I, I would um, extend my, um, you know, my assistance to any one of you who would want to utilize any of these uh, technologies for data analysis. Uh, for uh, small RNA sequencing, for transcriptomics, we do not do the, the data generation. Data generation, we outsource it. But what we do, do do is we do data analysis of large data sets and hybrid analysis assemblies of different types of data sets and incorporate them to get to where we want to go. For this purpose, uh, what I'm showing you is um, we infected uh, chick, we um, infected the cell line, albopictus cell line, and we also have an insect tree where we have the mosquito cycle going on. So we have the mosquitoes, we infect the pathogen with the mosquitoes with the, the necessary way. In the case of anaphylis, we go, it, we do, go do an rodent malaria through the mice. In the case of uh, human, in the case of chikungunya, we, uh, we can always mix it with blood and then give a membrane feed. You have an artificial feeding system by which we can uh, do the uh, infection and uh, get the tissues that we want. So our objective is to identify vector microRNAs primarily because there isn't much known about it. Uh, profile these microRNAs to know what is being re regulated on that specific time point or the specific time of uh, type of infection that is there. Predict these microRNAs, target microRNAs and pathway analysis validate these targets. So this is a discovery pipeline for uh, microRNAs. So even though we do have the database right now we have it for almost 10 to 12 arthropods of all the microRNAs, the fetching sequences, the primary microRNA, and we also have it for uh, humans. So anybody who wants to use it are wel is welcome to do it. So, and not only do we do just an, an uh, microRNA identification, we also go for novel microRNA identification, and we also have the pipeline by which you can go till the final differentiated microRNAs. Many times what happens is you do see several of them microRNAs that are being differentially regulated, but the size is huge. You know, almost half of them, if they're not regulated, they are going to be down-regulated or up-regulated. But what is important is to get to those significant clusters of microRNAs, a small set of microRNAs which would be of relevance. So we have other parameters, statistical analysis that are all fed into the system by which you come up with a handful of microRNAs that are most significantly regulated that would help us in asking the questions or answering the questions that we have. Based using our data, using our pipeline, we identified this was this just an idea to give you that this we did it. We have done it for several other uh, conditions also. So, but we, what we did find out was this was the number of microRNAs that were common, that were unique, and that were novel between two different separate um, conditions, different an insects in different conditions. So what was the take home message? When we did all this analysis, what we did find out was most of the microRNAs are down regulated during infection. What was important also was there were distinct clusters of microRNAs regulated depending on the kind of infection that it was that different depending on the different infection that was there. Similarly, we also have a microRNA target prediction pipeline. And uh, using this, we have uh, we identified that specific pathways which are of significance where they were being uh, regulated in these microRNAs 
And these pathways were mainly related to signaling as well as immunity. What we also saw was that the down-regulated and the up-regulated microRNAs interacted with one another by way of common targets, which were being regulated upon a specific condition. And additionally, what we also saw was, irrespective of some of the infection, there are some microRNAs and their associated targets that are being regulated upon any kind. This is, these are two different kinds of, this is an AD, ADS microRNA and this is an anaphylis microRNA. But you do see that the targets are common between them. So studying these targets may give us an, may give us an idea of how to tackle disease specific, not, not disease specific, um, pathogen as well as irrespective of the pathogen to target the mosquitoes. So we also have an target validation pipeline set in place wherein we use tissue specific profiling of different organelles. Apart from that, we use computational analysis as well as um, for prediction, target prediction and go ahead with the experimental validation along with um, uh, um, uh, RNA-seq, do it along with uh, degradome sequencing wherein by using antigomers, we transiently knock down the microRNAs and look for cleave products specifically and do the analysis. And combining these three different methods by hardcore computational biology and having an RNA-seq and a co-express with the microRNA at the same time point and then doing the analysis of that, along with that doing a degradome sequencing and getting those cleave products, we are able to come up with a very definitive number of uh, of targets which we can work on other than you're talking of hundreds of targets you're just wondering what to do with them because you don't want to miss any of them because that's all you have but here you're talking of specific very specific amount of targets that can be easily validated to prove my point this is then uh, this is an um, the cell uh, a mosquito cell uh, when what happens to it at the time of uh, blood feed so when you see over here, and as is already known, that blood feed is going to have an important role in several of these factors that are there, that are there with respect to oxidative stress. And what we have seen is by using all those computative and those whole pipeline that I was describing you to you about, that we clearly see that there is involvement of microRNAs in the upregulation and of downregulation of these specific features. So when we're talking of oxidative stress and maintenance of the equilibrium of the redox situation in the cell, we are not talking of just one microRNA, one, one target and this is what it is. That is not the case in the real life scenario. You're talking of a whole plethora of microRNAs which have a distinct targets working with one another and it is this that is resulting in the final scenario that you see in vivo. And this is what we are trying to look at. Getting information about a single microRNA very well and good, but that's not going to give you the real life scenario at all. So, so this is what we employ on a regular basis. And what we have seen is that because of this interplay, that these microRNAs and their associated targets are giving a playing a definite role in, in the redox toxification. This was done only on blood stages and just on blood feeding. We have not done on uh, infected uh, um, blood. We would like to do that. Uh, so if we do that, we know that there is going to be a possible case because we do see associated uh, immune related pathways, we strongly suspect that immunity would also be affected by these microRNAs. So what we do see from all these experiments is that host microRNAs, they do modulate pathogen infection, number one. And number two, these microRNAs regulate several important pathways that would be associated with signaling, oxidative stress, immunity and so on. The next logical question with respect to chikungunya, seeing that microRNAs are being regulated by its infection was to see whether these vector microRNAs bind to the 3' prime UTR of the pathogen and do these microRNAs that are binding, do they have an impact on regulation? So what we do see is apart from the microRNAs that is being modulated in the, the host scenario, we also see that the microRNAs may target uh, Chikwi untranslated region and may regulate virus development. So there are a lot of questions uh, 
that we would like to ask, um, what are the host factors, receptors that are involved in chiquine entry? We do know that uh, it's not going to be a single receptor because it's going to affect so many other viruses, uh, so many other hosts. But having said that, the insect, the mosquito, is only one or two. So we are more hopeful of getting insect-specific factors, receptors that would be critical. And what is the impact of this in the vector competence? What are those hotspots in the viruses that are able to change their the sequence in such a way that to uh, you know, beat this uh, receptor binding? Um, this is the most critical uh, work that I would like to concentrate for the rest of my life. Co-infections of dengue and chikungunya in the vector. What is the role the vector plays in the transmission of co-infection? What is the viral load that is, that is required for co-infecting and mono-infection and epidemiology of co-infection in India? Uh, we also would like to, uh, other, other important questions are what is the role of the host microRNA regulation that is the mammalian host, as well as cell tropism and uh, the host response in the chronic phase. Apart from the work that I described to you, we are nearing the end of my talk. Um, we, are, we have the chikungunya virus biology research in our institute has mainly four themes of which I, I took you through the divergence in evolution, as well as the virus vector interaction. We are also involved in understanding the basis of virus or virulence using studying or identifying viral suppressor proteins that are involved in RNAi suppression. And uh, we also have initiated work with, res with respect to the human microRNAs and their binding with the 3' prime UTR, along with the pathophysiology of the chronic phase. This is the team that does most of the work, an enthusiastic bunch of very sweet kids. And uh, acknowledgments are due because of this this, is, this work was possible because of my collaborators. We have an extremely dedicated set of uh, clinicians who, in spite of their busy schedule, are able to devote some time for our work. And these are my collaborators uh, where I learned, Dr. Scott Weaver's where I learned the virus uh, vector interaction studies. And here we are doing the co-infection uh, whole genome sequencing at this Osaka University. This is what welcomed me in 3SD. This is a, three, it's a sunset in 3SD, enough for me to make, make me fall in love with this place. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah.